Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Doug Graham, author of the 80-10-10 Diet, here today for Let's Cook Raw. And my special guest, I've known for 20 years, but we hardly ever get to see each other, is none other than the absolutely famous Chef AJ. Welcome, Chef AJ. Hi, thank you, Dr. Graham. You've accomplished so much in such a short time, a really short time. And, and I know it's been your life, but it's, it's amazing how far you've come and how many people you've reached and how much you've done. And I wanna just start out by, by applauding you for that. And uh, you just seem like nonstop ball of energy all the time, books and programs and seminars and speaking engagements, it's awesome. Well, thank you. You know, we've got a planet to save. And the only way we're going to do that is if people start eating plants. And that's so very true. And it's sort of um, like a guaranteed job for the rest of our life. We can just, we've, we've definitely got lots of work to do. So I'm glad you're motivated to do it. You're, you're a vegan, like you're a staunch vegan. You're a really well-informed, educated vegan um, you know, the science, you know, the kitchen, the culinary arts, you know, you know about food, uh, you know about nutrition, uh, so many areas that where you're fully comfortable. Uh, were you raised as a vegan? No, I wasn't. I actually, you know, I wanted to be vegetarian when I was younger. I didn't have a word for it other than I knew I didn't like eating animals. And I think one of the great things about my childhood was we actually were Orthodox Jewish and we didn't eat a lot of animals growing up. I mean, yes, of course we ate them, but to the degree that other people eat them, things like lobster and shrimp and crab, you know, and all those kind of seafood things or, or pork or bacon, there were so many animal products I was just never exposed to. And you can't crave or desire things you've never had. So yes, as Jewish people, we had, you know, we had lox, which I never ate because I, I, this fish just never smelled good to me. So yes, I had some, some animal products. I never enjoyed them. And actually my mom, had to hide them to get me to eat them. So for example, if she were to make bean chili and there were some crumbled ground beef in it, I, I could ostensibly eat that. So I never really had the desire for it, but also, you know, being Jewish and being kosher, like I never had a cheeseburger because you didn't mix milk with meat. I never had pepperoni pizza. So all these things that people love, I never had. You can't miss something you never had. So I wasn't raised vegan or vegetarian. I was raised on the standard American diet with, with, a, with a Jewish bent. But I knew I, I knew I loved animals and I made that association early on that, you know, they're my friends. You don't really eat your friends. And the day that I left home, which was September 1st, 1977, I was 17 and a half to attend the University of Pennsylvania. I never ate another animal again, at least knowingly. I mean, I can imagine there are times, you know, you ate at a restaurant that was chicken broth, but never knowingly ate another animal again. And that was over 43 years ago. And not looking back. No, and, and this is a fascinating thing about not craving what you've never had. Um, so many yeah. people... I mean, does a, does a non-smoker ever crave a cigarette? Does somebody that's never drank alcohol ever crave a drink? No. You only crave yeah. things, by the way, that you're not meant to have anyway. You know, I mean, I don't know anybody that's like, oh, my God, I have to have okra right now. You know, <laughs> I can't wait for my next hit of okra. <laughs> I love okra. <laughs> no, I love it, too. But I mean, you don't wake up in the middle no, of the I night exactly. having to go to, you know, go go to 7-Eleven. It brings up such another fascinating point that um, even though you were raised as a relatively standard American diet, as was I, uh, there were lots of things that simply weren't in my diet. And it also made making dietary change more of an experiment than a threat. Like, okay, well, I'll try this. Okay, I'll try that. Let's see what happens. And, and, and so eating a diet that's even just a little different than everybody else's and having to deal with some of the social... Um, because kids are hard on kids. I, I mean, I took it hard as a, as a Jewish kid in an all Catholic Christian school, um, a public school. But I mean, I, I, I know I took plenty of flack for that. And needlessly, I mean, needlessly. So, but you become willing to try this or try that and see what happens. It, it wasn't so threatening. And 
And I'm seeing that with a lot of the leaders in the raw food movement that even if they were raised particularly standard, uh, they had something that made it possible for them to be willing to experiment, go a little further, use their self as the experiment. Were you uh, in, in sports? Were you in science? What was your- No, you know, it's experience? funny because I think one of the reasons it was easy is because all I was doing at, at the first 26 years of being vegan was not eating animal products. So nobody really noticed or cared because I was eating the same crap that they were. You know what I'm saying? I, I mean, I could eat chips and French fries. So if they went somewhere, there was still things I could eat because I was eating like them minus the animal products. So you understand, but it was when I became healthier at the age of 43, when I first was introduced to the concept of raw food at the Optimum Health Institute, then there was a bigger shift. But by then I was, you know, pretty much my personality was set. And also I'm a fairly disagreeable person. And I, I never really cared that much what other people thought, you know, because I think if you do, you're not going to really be successful in life, especially if you're on YouTube where people are always saying terrible things about you. And, you know, so, so I think a lot of it has to do with your personality, whether or not you're able to withstand this social pressure, which I think is one of the hardest parts for people that want to eat healthier. You know, I had a client today, it's like, well, but how can I not drink? Everybody in my circle drinks. Well, then guess what? You're going to drink too. If you hang around with Dogs, you soon have fleas, right? Exactly. That, that will say, you know, if you hang around a barber shop long enough, eventually you get a haircut. Yes, I always, I was raised with, if you hang around with bank robbers, eventually you'll be driving the car. And, <laughs> you know, that's just, it's so true. So, you spent a long time just quietly being vegan. Yeah, I, I did. I, I, because, what? you know, without the internet, there wasn't a really a way to connect us like there is now, right, with all these groups. And, you know, even though Neil Barnard was alive and working then, it really wasn't until we had the internet that we really knew about things like PETA and PCRM and people really got connected. I don't think I even had a, a vegan friend until I was like probably in my 30s. I was really the only one. I was the odd kid. So, you know, I just kind of did my thing. I mean, I did do a little bit of animal rights and my heart is in animal rights but I'm so sensitive to the suffering of animals that I was never good at those protests. You know, I, I can't, I just, I, I just, it's not that I don't want to know, but I can't really see the pigs suffering like they, when they go to the vigils and stuff. So for a little bit of time in my 20s, I did do, I didn't do a civil disobedience because I knew I couldn't go to jail. At least I didn't want to go to jail. I had pets at home and who would take care of them. But I did a little bit of the direct action, which is where you get to the point where the police say, if you go one step further, we'll arrest you. So I was able to do that with the groups I work with places living. like, yeah, I did, I did, I worked with a last chance for animals and the national stop pound seizure coalition. I was the secretary. So my heart, and, and again, like I so admire people that work in animal rights, work in animal rescue. I don't have the, the soul for that. I, so I do what I do best, which is the teaching and, yeah, and the cookie. So I, 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 I really appreciate their work. And so that's really kind of what I did. And I realized, you know, it's, it's just, I, I can't see the suffering. I can't keep looking at those images. It's not helping me and it's not helping them. So I also noticed, and this is really kind of interesting and thank, thank goodness for people like Brian Wendell, because when Forks Over Knives came out, I saw a huge shift in people that were willing, like you say, to do an experiment with their diet. And unfortunately, most people are pretty selfish and just doing this for the animals, you know, people that go vegan for the animals like me, they pretty much stay vegan forever. Because if you don't want to harm another being, then you just, it's non-negotiable. And I think also having these Jewish roots help because there were things like, for instance, we were raised, you do not hunt, you do not hunt. And even though I don't think that the kosher laws are really that much better than the non-kosher laws for killing an animal. At least in Judaism, there was this underlying thing where we are going to be kind. We don't wear fur coats. We don't hunt, you know, things like, so I was raised for this compassion for animals, which was, which a lot of people don't, obviously. And so when Forks Over Knives came out, I found that it was a lot easier to enroll people in this idea of trying a plant-based diet or doing an experiment when there was something in it for them. When it was just like, you know, they didn't want to see the animal suffering. You know, it's like Paul McCartney said, if slaughterhouses had windows, everybody would be vegetarian. If we could put on television really what went on in a factory farm, you know, and it's funny because they call them meat packing places now, as if to say like, oh, we just take the meat and put it in a package. If they really showed the kill line, you know, right. I think a lot of more people would not do that. So but you know then the when story behind Forks Over Knives? 
I don't, but I know that Brian is a huge fan of yours. Well, Brian, yeah, actually, and Brian was at some of those Dick and Jane programs as well, and also at the at the um, whatever the house was called on the corner, just up the street. Um, anyway, but I saw Brian a lot when I would come to LA, but he was at a fast that I was running in Costa Rica. And he came down to that program. And while he was there, there's a fair amount of free time at a fast. You're supposed to do nothing. And so something struck him. Something struck him that, that the idea and he came to me and he says, look, I have this idea. What do you think? And I said, I think it's a fantastic idea. You ought to run with it as far as you possibly can. And so he did and it did. And it's just done fantastically well. I'm very proud of him and happy for him. Yeah. But yeah, it happened. It happened in Costa Rica at one of the fasts. Yeah, that's amazing. I did not know that story. The, the thing that was so great about that movie is people like were paying attention because they didn't know because they weren't taught and most of their doctors weren't taught that these diseases of what I call culinary excess are reversible. A lot of people thought this is their lot in life. It's genetic. My grandma had it. My mother had it. And then they're seeing now, wow, people just like me are reversing heart disease, diabetes, things like that. And so when they noticed there was something in it for themselves, they were willing to try. And then a lot of times then they did become also vegan, not just plant-based because, you know, once you stop eating animals and you, you're, you change because you went, I, I really believe in some of this, what some people call woohoo, that when you eat the animal, you take on all the fear hormones and all that stuff. And when you stop and you get clean, you can really see that there are sentient beings and they're not supposed to be ingested. No. So when did you realize that you knew more than the average bear, that you had something to offer that, that you shouldn't just quietly go about being a vegan and that, and that you want to start teaching others. Yeah, every time I go to the doctor, I'm aware of it. No, I'm just kidding. Not, not now, because- well, That was I, the first time. <laughs> actually, now I got to say, I do finally have a lifestyle medicine doctor who does know a lot more than me and I'm thrilled to have him on my team. But but I remember like just going to doctors and I remember like when I was obese in my 20s, I, I would say, you know, I think I'm addicted to sugar. Oh, that's impossible. So, but you know, it's not their fault. They're not, they're not really taught any nutrition in medical school. So when I was, I'm going to think what age was, it was in my forties that, you know, I started teaching at Dick and Jane when I was, when I was 40, but I wasn't really doing anything in the vegan world, so to speak, other than being vegan myself quietly. And then it was in my forties. I actually took this class. It's a lot of people think it's a cult. It's not, they're called landmark. It's an educational system. And I took some classes with them. And I, I took this one year class called the wisdom course. I remember, and it was a one year course and we could set goals, which I love the idea of doing that. And we had, we had to make this create this initiative like in the world and I was trying to be successful like I wanted a tv show I wanted I wanted all these things because I wanted them for me and then the minute I turned it over to instead wanting to help people my initiative was is I want to help people improve their diet you know I, I made it not about me so much but about what I could contribute and and then all of a sudden like my classes started it just everything kind of went into place when I changed it instead of I want this I want this it was like, what can I do to serve? How can I get this message out? And once I created this initiative, it's like everything opened up and just things started happening. You know, I had a book. I, it just really, the doors opened up once I changed it from me focused to you focused and how I could help people. And then, and that's really what happened. It was like through that class, I'm like, wow, this stuff is it's really powerful. You know, not make it about me, make it about the people. And then all the tools would be delivered. And that's really what happened. After that, it was like, I just, everything went into place like things like Dr. McDougall hired me for the, like actually three times to speak and that really increased I mean I really God bless Dr. McDougall he is my hero in many ways but also because he really gave me my big break it was 2009 he had me speak at the Celebrity Chef Weekend. And then, you know, a lot of people go to that thing and that started it. And then he had me again and then again. And he, you know, I really owe a lot to him. It's, it's on his shoulders that so many of us stand. So just that's kind of what happened. I didn't like have this grand plan, but it's just what once I said, you know, what can I do to help get people healthier? And then that's kind of what I did. <laughs> that's fantastic. What do you think inside of you is is the thing that's holding you back holding me back from what <laughs> uh, yeah, I, you know I, I would say you know I am not like 
um, I still have my demons. In other words, I, I, a lot of people don't know this because they're like, well, how can she have anxiety? Look at, she can do this. I suffer from the time I'm little, I suffer from horrible, horrible anxiety. And I actually, it got so bad at one point. That's my first book on process talks about how, when I developed panic disorder and agoraphobia, I didn't leave my house for a year and actually lost my job and my house because of it. It's not disabling right now. I manage it through, through, through diet and exercise. I refuse to take psychiatric medicine anymore. I work with a wonderful psychologist named Dr. Doug Lyle, who wrote The Pleasure Trap. But I think if anything holds me back, it's, it's that I still have, I'm wired this way, underlying anxiety. I mean, and, and so I, I, I want to succeed despite it. You know what I'm saying? But it, but it is always kind of lurking there. You know what I mean? I do. So that would, that would that'd probably be the one thing that really holds me back, because if I didn't have it, I could do more. And one of the things about this pandemic that's been nice for my nervous system is I don't have to travel anymore. I don't have to get on a plane. So it's been nice and calm because those kind of things, even though I can do them, they're hard for me. So so that I would say that just and, and I'm 60. I don't anticipate it. Necessarily. I mean, if, if some, you know, everybody has a, a cure or whatever. But Dr. Doug Lau says this is genetic. This is who you are. And so what we need to do is manage it. And we manage it by being, that's why I left LA. I'm in a calm and peaceful, quiet environment now. I'm in a smaller town. And, and of course the food helps. I mean, you've got, I mean, the, I mean, when I was not eating this way, when I was eating sugar and caffeine, it was off the charts, the anxiety. Okay. Now it's, now it's manageable. And what would you say are your personality strengths that allow you to go so far? <sighs> That, that I'm, I'm disagreeable. I mean, I'm not going to go. I, I have, I've always questioned the status quo. I don't do, you know, when I was a little, my mom would say whatever she would say and I'd go, why? And she'd go, you know, and I would, why, why, why? why I'm tenacious. I, I am, I am like a dog with a bone, you know, I, I just, I don't, I won't accept the status quo if the status quo is not acceptable. And so I'm not afraid to, to break away from the pack. I would rather be healthy and sane and not have a million friends than have to go along with what other people are doing when it's wrong and it's going to make ill health for me. And that's, this is what I see in most of my clients, especially women. I understand that from an evolutionary psychological basis, people want to be part of a group and I do too, but not if that group is going to keep me fat and sick. Okay. So so in your vegan world of all the acceptable foods within fruits and vegetables and plants and tubers and on through the list, um, which ones do you not like at all? <laughs> I, I, um, it, it, if I'm, listen, here's the thing. Hunger's the best sauce. There's nothing that I quote won't eat in the plant world unless I'm allergic to it. I am allergic to soy. I'm allergic to black pepper. So I'm not going to eat things I'm allergic to, but there's things that I don't enjoy as much as other things. Uh, celery, for example, huh. I don't know why I just, um, just don't, I I'll eat it, but it's not like I'm going to go and make a meal out of it. Like I would like say, you know, arugula, which I love, right. Mm -hmm. um, buckwheat's never been my favorite. If it's raw and sprouted, I like it, but cooked buckwheat just, just aren't, just that's that. That's probably about it. I am not picky now that I've uh, managed my food addiction and understand what that is. Really, any whole natural food, I will find a way to enjoy. But those two are probably, you know, if you're having me over for dinner, don't serve me celery and buckwheat, okay? Okay. So, what's your favorite fruit? <laughs> oh my God, you know that is a very hard question because top there is three, no top five top twelve. Yeah, no, but the thing is with fruit, there's no bad fruit. There really isn't. I mean, seriously. I mean, there's fruits that you prefer more because when fruit is in season, like I could easily say my least favorite fruit is grapefruit, except when you find that perfect grapefruit in season. Do you know what I'm saying? So fruit fruit is a magical category because it's really, it, it, there's no bad fruit. I mean, the first things, I mean, you know, jackfruit is amazing, right? I mean, that's like, that's like eating like candy or ice cream. I love jackfruit. You can buy it now organic frozen in bags. So you don't have to go through all the, you know, you know how hard it is awesome. to clean those things. Um, what you see watermelon when it's in season is my favorite cherries when they're like, we got a Steve Middleman, by the way, just brought me a watermelon. It, it was a terrible watermelon, but when it's in season, it's my favorite cherries when it's in season, it's my favorite, you know, apples, I love apples, but there are some apples that I love more than others, like the envy apple. I don't know if you've ever yeah, had it. Sure. That is like that's that's more than that's like a dessert apple. So, so you can't. Season, 
Yeah. Now there is a melon and I haven't seen it since I moved to the desert because the only place I was able to find it was at Gelson's and I haven't checked the Gelson's here, but it's called the sugar kiss melon and it's a cantaloupe, but it's a cantaloupe on steroids. So, so yeah, fruit, you can't, I, that's uh, to say what your favorite fruit is like, who's your favorite pet? You love them all. I mean, fruit is like that category that fruit's amazing. Okay. Good to know. Yeah. And, and if you were, if you were thinking about the projects that you're working on right now, which one grabs you the most? Well, I'm, I'm working on my fourth book. It, it actually already is an ebook, but I'm expanding on it. And it's called A Date with Dessert. And it excites me because it's it's going to be part raw, part cooked, but it's it's basically a dessert cookbook without the things that I don't eat, which are sugar, oil, and salt based on the fruit, the whole fruit, nothing but the whole fruit. And what excites me about that is I, I've had bestseller books on Amazon. I've never had a New York Times bestseller because I choose not to go with publishers because it's just, you know, I like being able to control this, even though every single book I've had a publisher has wanted to publish it and they want to publish it afterwards. But what I like about this dessert book idea is not, listen, not everybody's going to go vegan, right? However, most people are going to choose to do, to enjoy desserts the rest of their life. And, and it's, it's the uh, forward is written by Dr. Neil Barnard. And I remember when I had the opportunity to go on the show Cupcake Wars, and I, I went on it with a very well-known uh, chef, Chef Eric Lachesser, who's a vegan chef. And he was also a pastry chef and we didn't win, but we didn't lose. We weren't the first to go home, but we weren't in the finals. And I didn't want to do it because I knew I had to slightly compromise my beliefs and use a little bit of oil for some of the recipes and a little bit of sugar. And that's not how I ate or cooked. And, and Dr. Barnard said to me, just do it. It's going to be good exposure for vegan. He said, he said, bring them in with dessert and then hit them over the head with kale. And so while my first three, three books did very well, I think that this one has the potential to be enjoyed by people that are not vegan, because most people are looking for healthier desserts to not eat so much sugar and flour. And because I was a pastry chef for five years, I have some credibility there. And so I think that if people buy this book, they might then find the other stuff. So that's why I'm excited about it. Okay, and, and tell me, tell me, tell everybody, What's the next project after that? Oh boy, you know, I, I, I think we're thinking of a podcast and the thing is, is I do a live show every day now and I love it, but it's quite a, I don't want to say a chore, it's not a chore. It's, it's, it takes a lot to do this every single every day, day, put on, you know, wash your hair and get the lights. And so I committed to doing it one year. It's like my pandemic show. I started the day the pandemic started and I, I booked up until March 22nd, 2021, which is my 61st birthday. So it'll be like a year and a day. And I'm not going to say I'm not going to continue. I might just not do it every day live multiple times a day. And I might do some pre-recorded. But I love the idea of doing a podcast because people can then listen in different ways. They don't have to use data. You know, there's there, there's some things nice about that. So I, and then I don't have to always have my hair done and things like that. So wow. that's what I kind of like what to do next. And also, I'm always open to doing TV. You know, I get offers from time to time. But, you know, again, I'm really I, I'm not going to do a show where, you know, they're going to force me to to use ingredients that I'm that I don't believe in. And that's that's the thing, because I could have had, you know, a bigger show on a bigger network, but I didn't want sponsors to be ones that were, you know, selling meat and oil. It, I mean, it's hard. It's hard sometimes when you have ethics to often get that level that you want. But I, you know, I always think of the Frank Sinatra song, I did it my way, because I have to be able to live with myself. Even when I was an actress, when I was doing commercials, I just, I wouldn't do a commercial for a fast food restaurant, even though it paid, I just couldn't, I couldn't do it, you know? You don't lose anything by standing up for what you believe in. You never lose anything. And more Agreed. doors open up. Yeah. And, and in that light, trying to think the best, like a really nice way to say it. Um, if your view, okay, let's do it this way. Your view is cooked food, whole food. You know, I, I, whole food. No, well, okay. So I, I, a whole food to me is something that hasn't been processed or refined. So is it is it whole food? I, I never thought about it that way because if you cook it, 
I, I don't know. I mean, okay. I, I think answer. that I think it's unprocessed because I mean, like, I think, okay, so let, let's take like beans, for example, let's like you have chickpeas. If you put them in a food processor and put some lemon and garlic in to make hummus, I don't, I consider that that you did some processing, but I don't consider it a processed food. I don't consider it refined. And so if you, if you take a food and you put heat to it, is it still a whole food? I would say probably yes. You know, I don't know if you read the book by Rangham called Catching Fire. And it, I thought it was a really interesting book. It was recommended by the doctors at True North because the subtext was how cooking made us human. And he makes a case for the fact that the human brain didn't grow exponentially in size until we ate cooked food. But the, the, I, the most interesting takeaway that I had from that book is that animals that don't cook their food, that can't cook their food, for example, a snake, the snake cannot, doesn't have the ability to do that. When they did these experiments with the snakes and offered them whatever it is they ate cooked, they ate more that they seemed to prefer it. And I think it has to do with calorie density. So I, I find that really interesting. And I know that I tried the raw diet for a couple of years. I think when somebody has a disease that they're healing from, there is nothing better than a 100% raw food diet that is free of sugar, oil, salt, all processed food. And that and I include coffee and alcohol, chocolate and all that stuff in that. Uh, the thing is, is I also know, and I've literally worked with thousands of people now personally and in groups, that for somebody to be successful on any kind of plan, it has to be sustainable for them. Absolutely. And so, the, yeah, so that so I, I admire people like you and Dr. Rick Dina that, that, that can do that because you're like, I'm like you on my plan, you're like you on your plan, because a lot of people think, oh my God, she's so extreme. She doesn't drink alcohol. She doesn't, you know, that kind of thing. But you have to find the plan that's going to be the most doable for you. Also, the, the, the biggest problem I have with the raw food diet is I'm always cold. I was born cold. My, my When I wake up in the morning and take my body temperature, it's like a little bit over 96. I don't know why, that's what it is. And that's why when I live in Palm Springs now, it's 122 and I'm like, oh, it's, it's nice out, you know? So, so with, with having food that's not warm, like the first thing I have every morning is, is broth. I, I just don't like being cold, but I, I, so is it not a whole, I don't know. I've never, I've never looked at it that way. It wasn't, uh, wasn't loaded question. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, the thing is, is what the thing that I, I think if I'm most passionate about one message, because not everybody's going to be raw, not everybody's going to be vegan, but the one thing that I think anybody that's in any kind of a health space, even if they're doing it wrong, is that I think everybody can agree, we're not supposed to eat processed foods. Whether they're vegan, whether they're raw, whether they're keto, we're just not supposed to. If you cook it or don't cook it, I, I, what I'm saying is I think you know that's still better. I, we're just not supposed to eat processed food. And that's what I just can't get through to people. It's like, no, you're supposed to eat you know, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, is little, you know, by processed. Yeah, that's by processed. You mean refined? Yeah, I mean refined. I mean, like you're not supposed to grind the grain into a flour, and and the you know you're not the you're supposed to eat it in its wholest form. That doesn't mean that you can't do some things to it that you're going to make it more enjoyable, but you're not supposed to eat packaged food for the most part. You know, things that come in a can, a box, a bottle, or a bag. Exactly. That's what Thank my message you. has been for a long. And yes, I, 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 if I have canned tomatoes that are salt free, I, I'm not, I'm not saying you have to be that extreme, but you can. I have people. No, you don't have to. I mean, I buy nuts; they come in bags. Right. That's that's what I mean. If if you buy food in packaging, the packaging should have the one ingredient that's in the package. Right. That's what I mean. If you ever. But that's have hard to, for people because Americans. Right. You, you know, it's, it, it's a it's a real mind shift. Uh, a mindset shift. And I know I've had insights in my life where I dug both heels in and said, I don't want to go there. Um, and then realized that by digging my heels in, I was actually planting the seed. And then it just took a little time for that seed to grow and the next shift happened. Uh, that's, that's really, I mean, because people talk to me and they go, but chewing is a process. Using a knife is a process. Oh my a God. Food processor is obviously a process. And I go, yeah, but that's not what, pro that's not what yeah. we're talking. We mean refined. We mean refined. What are we supposed to do? Swallow it whole? Into its separate individual components and maybe throwing away the fiber, but just eating the juice or throwing away the this and just eating the, I mean, vitamin A is a pretty highly processed 
substance? You know, where was the food that it came from? So yeah, good, good. Whole foods is, is a crazy yep. important key. But people totally just, agree. you know, they, you know, most Americans eat, I think, I think it's Dr. Furman said something like 92% of their calories from animal products and processed food, less than 10% from fruits and vegetables. So very few people are eating fruits and vegetables and processed food is readily available, easily affordable, socially acceptable. And I don't consider it food, but other people do because they're addicted to it. Sugar, fat, and salt, it sells. Well, they had to put the word food at the end of the phrase right um it's there are various types of therapy um, that are called therapy but we other people question whether it's a therapy just because it has the word therapy at the end and i've heard the same thing said about well you know if we say full contact last man standing cage yoga is it yoga yeah <laughs> Well, maybe it's not. And, and so when we start calling things junk food, um, processed food, uh, you know, you have to really wonder why did they even put the word yeah. food after the word junk? I mean, who would eat that? Who right. Well, my, I believe it's Michael Pollan that calls it food like, you know, food like substances. Right. Things we can eat for sure. Yeah. Let's focus back. If you were going to be concise, which you don't have to be. But if you were going to be concise, what would be the take home message of an interview with Chef AJ? Oh boy, I wish I, I, I this is a great question. I wish I had time to think of it because, you know, I think about that Michael Pollan quote, eat food, mostly plants, not too much. I, I agree with the not too much. I, I disagree with that. I eat a lot of that, but because I follow, you know, the principles of caloric density is, um, I don't know, just, you know, eat plants, be kind. I mean, what, what more could there be, you know? When you, when you eat plants, you are being kind. You're being kind to the planet. You're being kind to the animals and you're being kind to yourself. Because I, 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 you know, I would love everybody to do what you're doing, what I'm doing. I don't think that's going to happen. So let's just get people away from animals. Then we won't have these pandemics. Right. That, I mean, if we could just do that, even if we get people to stop drinking milk, that that would be a huge sift. And I understand that I would love people not to eat processed food, but it, it, depending on where they are in the journey, that might be just too much of a stretch. You know what I mean? For some people right away, it, because I ate this stuff for 46, 43 years. But sure. just, somebody's just, got to lead. Yeah, somebody's got to lead. And I'm glad there's leaders like you yeah. uh, that are out there just relentlessly, like you say, every day every day um, being true to your mission. I'm really proud of you for that. Thank uh, you. Uh, if you were a guy, I'd say you were a mensch. <laughs> I still am a mensch, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Does that make you a mensha or something? A menchette, a menchette, I think. There must be a word for a female mensch. And, and it's just a treat to get to spend some time with you. Uh, we will post links and whatnot so everybody knows how to get in touch with you, but Anything else that you would like to tell your viewers? Let's see, just, just do an experiment. You know, I love this idea from Dr. Doug Lyle. You don't want to say, I'm never going to do this again the rest of my life because that sets yourself up to fail. You know, they, it's like if I say to you, Dr. Graham, don't think about an elephant. What do you think about an okay. elephant? But experiments are great because you get useful information from them. And also remember that failure is not final unless you quit you know think about a boxing match when when a when, when somebody gets knocked down they did not lose the match it's only when they don't get back up and so you're going to have some bumps along the road and changing your diet is probably harder than changing your religion the thing is the benefits are amazing what will happen to you in terms of your health and what you're doing for the planet and what the what you're doing for the animals but just just do an experiment like the holiday Lent, where people stop doing something like drinking coffee or alcohol or chocolate, different people choose different things. It's like, I think 42 days or six weeks. If, mo if most people can do something for six weeks, you could probably do something even if it's difficult for three weeks. Run an experiment, get the data, see how you feel when you remove things from your diet or when you add things from your diet. You're your best, 
you, your body is the best teacher. So that, that's what I would say. And you know, they always say aim for progress, not perfection. I only know one perfect human. His name is Dr. Alan Goldhammer. I don't even know if he really is human. He did this. He, for some reason, he got this information at 16. It was yeah. easy for him. We're mo most of us are not Alan Goldhammer. So you know, strive, you can strive for perfection, but just realize that, you know, do your best. This is what I learned at the Optimum Health Institute, do your best and bless the rest, but do something just because you can't do everything or eat like someone else or be like something else, somebody else doesn't mean you shouldn't do anything because I think any change you make in the direction of optimum health, if you do it consistently, will yield a result. And that's the key word, consistency. It's not what you do some of the time that matters, meaning if you have a slip or had something off plan, it's what you do most of the time that matters. And, you know, you, you really, I, I, I just love how Dr. Clapper says your body's never not looking. I really look at food as every bite you take moves you towards health or more or towards disease. It, it's not, food is not neutral. Maybe, maybe water is, I guess, but even then you could drink too much water and die. Well, so well, every well. bite you take, every bite matters and either you're going towards health or you're going towards sickness and, and think, and don't think about right now, think about how you want to look and feel when you're older. You know, there's a wonderful video on the True North website where it's a split screen of a guy who made different choices. And on one side, he's putting his tie on, on the other side, he's putting his oxygen on. You know, you have to understand that sometimes things that make you feel good right now have a long-term deleterious effect. So while it's great to live in the moment, you have to realize that you're, <laughs> this is the thing when we're young, we think we're invincible and we can get away with things. And it seems like we can, but you can't trust me. When you get older, you'll thank me. Nobody's bulletproof. Right. Chef AJ, thank you so much for your focus, for your time, for your energy, uh, your vibrance. You bring so much to the plate every single time. And uh, we're just really honored to have you join us with Let's Cook Raw. I hope you'll come back again and bring us another session. It was, it was great to spend this time with you. And I look forward to the next time our paths cross personally. That'll be great. Absolutely. And I'd love to interview you sometime on my, on my show, especially I'm about grains, that. because I, I've said things like to people about how I think there's like, I, I mean, I eat grains, but there's something about rolled oats that almost like just have this addictive like quality because these people, they can't not eat them. And I, I think you're the perfect person to talk about that. I would love to talk with you about that. That'll be yeah. a lot of fun. That's great. Uh, everybody, this is Dr. Doug Graham reminding you to go to health. <laughs>